what is global base. Um, global base, or tropical base, as it's sometimes known, is an umbrella term that has been given to various musical movements around the world that seem to be connected by some common traits. Um, native instruments have defined it as local turned global via the internet, which I think is a pretty good way of putting it. And um, I don't know, it encompasses styles such as cumbia and baile funk from Latin America, uh, Gom and Kwaito from South Africa, Kaduro from West Africa and Portugal, Electro Shabi from Egypt, Duke and Footwork from the USA, and you could kind of go on and on with all these different scenes that have been gaining recognition via the internet, I guess. Um, so, in addition to all of these local scenes, the, the other big movement that's been taking place is the fact that West, a lot of Western producers are picking up on these types of music and becoming more and more influenced by these emerging traditions. And it's been reflected in the output of independent record labels such as, I guess, Fade to Mind in the US or Night Slugs in the UK or Golden Mist in Portugal. Um, and if you listen to any of the music that comes out on any of those labels, like, it's pretty clear. And, um, yeah, and the influence of global bass has also reached the mainstream, I guess, spreaded by the likes of um, Diplo and MIA, and then also Drake and Rihanna. They're all kind of jumping onto the bandwagon. So, essentially, global bass seems to refer to contemporary music that combines characteristics of traditional musical styles, but with an electronic sound palette. Um, but I guess if I had to say it in a nutshell, that's how I would describe it. And the emergence and existence of the genre, for me, is fully dependent on um, technology and two forces in particular. One is the internet and the other one is the availability of musical software. So accessibility seems to be the key word here, uh, both in terms of people being able to access different styles of music really easily, regardless of wherever you are in the world, and also in terms of people having access to the means by which to create electronic music. Um, you know, with companies like Native Instruments and just programs like Pro Tools or Logic or Ableton or even GarageBand, it just, you know, brings that opportunity to, it doesn't, to anybody. Anybody can have a go if they want, whether it's good or bad or whatever, you can still have a go. Um, so Global Base seems to truly be a 21st century phenomenon because it doesn't really have any geographical boundaries, or does it? I don't know, we'll discuss. And um, yeah, well, as demonstrated by all the different musical styles that are so-called Global Base, and the fact that it doesn't really matter where in the world you are, whether you want to listen to that music or make some kind of music, um, so it makes me think, can we even refer to all of this music as one genre, or should we be looking at each scene independently, um, or maybe a bit of both? And um, in my opinion, I think that you could actually argue that the rise of global bass music isn't something new at all, but it's just a continuation of all the musical and cultural exchange that has been happening on this planet between different communities for hundreds and hundreds of years. And the only difference now is that we've got Wi-Fi, so everything's happening a million times faster than it used to. Um, because now, yeah, you don't even need to travel, right? Like, if you want to listen to music from Latin America or South Africa or somewhere, you literally just have to go on your laptop. And it's quite amazing. I think it's a pretty good thing. Okay, so... Um, this is my map of the world that I thought I would use to um, explain one example of when I talk about the fact that musical development and exchange and um, culture has been going on for hundreds of, hundreds of years. So now I feel like I'm doing like a TED talk with this thing and the math. I'm like, hey. <laughs> so um, if I said to you guys that modern day R&B music in America, like Beyonce or R. Kelly, has its roots in Arabic music from the Middle East. How many of you would agree with that or think that it's nonsense? Well, you guys don't have to say anything, but <laughs> it's just something to think about. But the thing is that it actually does have its roots in Middle Eastern music. And 
The reason why it does is because of the mass movement of people that happened from Africa to the Americas during the transatlantic slave trade, which lasted for 400 years. And um, I mean, in a very general way, when we look at music, when you study music of Africa, there's a general difference between North American. North African music and Sub-Saharan African music. So in Sub-Saharan Africa, a lot of the musical styles are driven by rhythms and drumming, and they're very percussive, and that seems to be the driving force be behind a lot of genres, for example, Kaduru or any of the South African musics. Um, <clears throat> and so African people from this Sub-Saharan part of Africa, when they were transported across the Atlantic, um, as slaves. Most of people from here ended up in northern Brazil and then also the Caribbean. And so the music in those parts of the world now, again, are very rhythmic. So if you look at cumbia or reggaeton or rumba or santeria drumming in Cuba, they're all driven by drums. And in North Africa, it's a different story. So North Africa's had a lot of interaction with the Arab world because of its geographical location, because of the um, Islamic empires and the spread of the religion of Islam, and then also Arab trade and Arab, the Arab slave trade as well. So from the Middle East, we can see, I mean, if you go all the way from Ethiopia all the way over to the other side, to Morocco, you can see that there's, like, there's motifs of Middle Eastern musical styles that run through all the musical cultures in North Africa. And so then slaves from this part of Africa normally ended up in North America, well, in the southern states of North America. And so the development of black music in North America took quite a different route to how it developed in Latin America or the Caribbean. So there you had, it was much more driven by vocal styles and harmonies and melodies and the tunes, which hark back to Middle Eastern music where you have the makam, and obviously drumming plays a big part, but melodies and uh, the vocal style also has a strong importance. So when you think about the ornamentation in modern R&B music, when they're like, ha, ha, well, I can't do it, but you know, it's very, you know, there's a lot of ornamentation and that reflects essentially the Arabic music styles, whether you're listening to the Ney or Arabic, music, Arabic singing or anything like that. And obviously it developed in its own way, so, you know, through vocal styles that turned into the blues and ragtime came together, and then you had jazz. Again, with jazz music, all the, the parts played by the main instruments again reflect the musical styles of here. So that's just one example to show that Music is always evolving, always changing, and it follows the movement of people and it follows interactions. And it's not just westwards, but also eastwards as well. Um, on the last radio show I did on NTS on Saturday, I was actually looking at the music of the African diaspora that lives in the Indian subcontinent, so Pakistan and India. There's actually some really um, interesting communities there of people, they look... African, but they're actually Pakistani or Indian, and they've created their own communities. They're mostly Muslim, Sufi Muslim, so music plays a really big part in their culture. And again, it's just another example of how cultures and music have shifted. And for me, the global bass movement that's taking place now is definitely connected to everything else here. Now I'm going to show you an example of Electro Shabi, which is... Um, a movement of modern electronic music that's kind of sprouted up in post-revolution Egypt. And um, it's a really interesting genre that combines traditional wedding or celebration music that you find in Egypt, but with uh, sounds that sound like they should be, you know, like there's a lot of auto-tunes, so it sound a bit, sounds a bit trappy and it's quite intense. Um, and I think this is just demonstrates another layer of how the global bass movement has affected music all around the world. Oh, you can't see it on there, but that underground on the surface thing that was coming up 
at the bottom. That's like the name of the collective of all these musicians in Cairo. So if you search that on, it's a YouTube channel, but also on Facebook, then you can watch um, loads of different videos that they've made. And there's also a really good little film where um, they interview, I think they must have filmed it on an iPhone or something, because the sound quality is like, is quite um, grainy, but it's interesting to hear them speaking about why they're making this music and what it means to them. Um, the direct translation of Shabi and Electro Shabi means popular, and it means like they, they picked it up because it's like for the people, by the people. And now I'm, I'm going to move on to West African uh, music and influences, starting off with a track by DJ Mar Fox, who will be here later chatting in the panel discussion and then also DJing. And this is my favorite track of his called Bit Binary. Yeah, so really high octane, good dancing track. I mean, uh, it's pretty obvious just from listening to it that obviously uh, that it has some African influences, but in particular West African. Uh, DJ Mar Fox is uh, from Lisbon in Portugal, but his heritage is from Sao Tome and Principe, which are two small islands off the West African coast. And the music that he makes um, really reflects all the musics that you see from that part of the world. And my next uh, track example will show you that connection. This is um, <clears throat> an example of Funumana music, which comes from Cape Verde, which is near Sao Tome as well. Okay. I know everyone probably wants to carry on watching that amazing Buddha shaking, but yeah. Okay, so that's, that was an example of uh, Funimana music, like I said, from Cape Verde. Again, just by listening, you can see how DJ Mar Fox might, you know, may have been influenced by his heritage from, that, from those West African islands in creating his own music. But the music that he's creating is regarded as very electronic, um, it's perfect for the nightclub scene that's basically, you know, the, our contemporary kind of main musical movement, movement I guess. And, uh, but then on, on that second video, you could also see how electronic influences are having an effect on music that's actually coming out of places like Kep Vede. So you've got the drumming and you've got the traditional accordion sound, but then you've also got the guy holding an electric guitar, which is probably the most kind of obvious uh, symbol of Western musical traditions coming into contact with places like that. And this third video uh, is one of um, traditional West African drumming from that part of the world.
And um, <clears throat> now moving on to the next track, you guys must, might know this label, Nafi. It's a record label that's based in Mexico, and it's kind of come out of this whole global bass movement. Um, they, they release music by loads of young contemporary producers who are either based in, um, in Mexico or other Latin American countries. And this track by Paul Mamota, um, he's a Chilean, a Chilean producer, and I also found out he's speaking at the LA version of this event. So if you guys want to tune in to hear what he has to say from the horse's mouth. No. Um, and I, I really like that track as well. And um, yeah, you'll be able to hear that it sounds so fresh and so current and so cool as well. You know, it fits into this whole aesthetic that we see running through Fade to Mind or nights like Ghetto Gothic or Tropical Waste in London. Um, and, you know, you can hear that he's drawing on his Chilean heritage in terms of the um, traditional drum patterns and the polyrhythms that you hear, but it sounds so new because he's using this electronic sound palette that combines with that aesthetic of, you know, computer art and I can't remember the word for it, but it's like health goth or something. Have you heard of that new uh, like fashion movement, health goth? Um, but yeah, it seems to chime into that and obviously that exists so much in the Western world. So again, drawing um, connections between all these different cultures that you might not necessarily draw the links between otherwise. And so my final example from Latin American Caribbean music to see how everything connects up is um, a recording of Cuban Santeria drumming. And um, Santeria drumming is practiced only in Cuba, I think, and it's uh, part of a religion where, uh, where they worship different gods and spirits through drumming. So the drums are seen as um, holy entities, I guess, and they believe that by striking the drum, the hand striking the drum, that's the purest form of energy that you can create, can create and that's the energy that brings out certain spirits that they w wish to invoke in different ceremonies. Um, it harks back to the time of the transatlantic slave trade, so all these kind of, this animism and spirit belief was brought over by slaves across the Atlantic. And so that's the reason why I've chosen it, because I think it's a really good example to draw the historical connection <clears throat> with Drake and Nafi. Okay, so that was uh, an amazing video of like a spirit worship ceremony in Cuba with Santeria drumming. Uh, if you want to find out more about that, actually, Giles Peterson recently made a film that um, it looks at the evolution of rumba music in Cuba, but a big part of it has to do with Santeria drumming, so that features a lot in the film, and it's really interesting. I learned loads from watching it. Okay, so those are all my musical examples to just give you, you know, a very, I don't know, cursory idea of the connections that we see that now have sort of culminated in this thing we're calling global bass.
the next thing, which is the role of technology. It's the final thing I want to talk about, really. Um, as I mentioned in my introduction, for me, global base as a phenomena exists because of two main strands of technology. One is the internet, and the second is musical software. And, um, you know, the internet has just been so monumental in changing the way that we listen to music, the way we make music, the way we put it out. I mean, if it wasn't for SoundCloud, I wouldn't even be here now because that's how, that's how my music got picked up in the first place and I never thought anybody was going to listen to it. Um, so we have to take all of these things into account and then obviously with musical software, again, native instruments or any of the other programs that we can use to make music and the availability of technology like laptops or iPhones, for recording and making music. It's just opened up this sphere to so many more millions of people around the world, which is incredible. And I think we have to be really um, like thankful for that because you know, if it wasn't for us being here now, we wouldn't be experiencing it. It's totally to do with um, you know, technological advances that have been happening over the last 10, 20 years. And uh, yeah, so that's another strands to um, global base, but now maybe you don't want to call it global base, I don't know, maybe someone can think of a better name. I was talking to my dad about it and he came up with the term Comet Earth, which like, <laughs> I totally didn't get, but he was like, it has to be something to do with moving fast, so like a comet, and it's got to be about the Earth, so I don't know, <laughs> maybe you guys will be into that. But anyway, so I hope I've like, done some sort of justice to global base as a movement and hopefully provoked some thoughts in your minds. Obviously, you guys have just got to make up your own minds about how you define and see this movement.